Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining our latest uh, seminar. Uh, my name is Scott Arthur. I'm the general manager here at REO Master. I'm really looking forward today to the webinar. We've got a great um, panel of um, speakers um, which are going to talk about um, dispute resolutions. Just want to give you a quick update on REO and Master, what's happening here. In the meantime, while we've got a captive audience, uh, we've been very busy doing a lot of work on REO Cloud over the last couple of months during the pandemic. We've seen an increase in clients um, onboarding to REO Cloud, giving businesses more flexibility, um, being able to work from home, um, work remotely. So we've seen an increase in that. My team has been very busy developing new features and we're regularly releasing on a monthly basis um, new features. So if you haven't seen REO Cloud for a while, I'd encourage you to definitely reach out to our sales team and also um, bring our support team. They're very knowledgeable about that particular product. We've also spent a lot of time um, through the pandemic creating uh, small videos um, that are available on our YouTube channel that will give you good insight into that particular product um, and the benefits, uh, showcases the benefits of those. And we're also running a number of other webinars on a monthly basis to show you um, the new features, also what else is uh, happening with REI Cloud, how to streamline your workflows and also get the most out of REI Cloud. Uh, yesterday we sent out an email talking about bookings. We're really excited to announce that we are well underway with the testing and development of REI Cloud bookings. Um, obviously a lot of you have used um, REI Master or EaseRes previously in the short term space. We're now moving that into REI Cloud products. We'll have further announcements uh, coming uh, about that and then also when to register your interest for that particular product. Um, don't forget to join our Facebook and also our YouTube uh, channels to get all the latest content about um, things happening at REI Master. I'm going to hand over to our guest speakers uh, now. Um, we're really lucky to have caliber speakers such as Frank and Chris joining us today. Uh, Frank obviously brings um, decades is probably uh, the right word, but I won't be so harsh on that. Frank brings a lot of experience to anything related to body corporate management rights related legal um, issues and is at the forefront um, in guest speaking and obviously being on a number of uh, committees and providing people with the legal insights um, based on his experience. So extremely lucky. So thanks again, Frank. And this time we've also got Chris, who's the Strata Advisor at Heinz, who used to be um, the Body Corporate um, Commissioner, which there's only one job like that. So I'm sure Chris can share his insights today on how to resolve disputes. Hopefully not too many of you have actually met Chris and you've been able to work out the um, dispute before it got to Chris himself. Um, but as I say, very lucky to have the calibre of speakers today and um, hopefully everyone's going to learn something today and avoid having to go through um, any disputes in the future. Thanks again. I'll hand over to Frank. Beauty. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I suppose uh, traditionally these have always been done at a Rundle Hills Country Club. So uh, it's funny to be sitting at home just doing them. And we actually did have this one lined up um, just before COVID arrived. So I still remember sort of emailing Kelly as, as things were descending into the COVID abyss saying we might have to cancel it. Oh, I'm not sure. Do we? Don't we? Do we? And then it was just all over. So here we are finally going back I suppose back to the future in a sense. So Chris, um, and, and really part of this was um, Chris joined Heinz six months ago, mate, I'm looking at the dates now, um, with uh, a view to a lot of what we're talking about today, which is resolving disputes other than through um, litigation, other than through legal demands and threats and all that sort of stuff. And so I suppose where we've got to is that you're never going to lose, I suppose, the opportunity or the ability um, and sometimes the desire to go hard legally. But I'd say probably at least nine times out of 10, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do before that that prevents the need to actually go legal. So I suppose in a sense, um, what we are trying to do and, and what hopefully Chris was on board with when he arrived with us uh, is to put lawyers out of some business um, in terms of that pure litigious sense. So. Um, and I think that's one of the real big things that, that Chris joined us because I suppose at, from Chris's perspective, and I'll let Chris introduce himself in a minute, um, as five and a half years as Commissioner for Body Corporate and Community Management, which is the repository for every single strata dispute in Queensland in effect, he never had anyone ring the office to say, gee, I'm glad I bought that unit. 
what he had was five and a half years of conciliations, adjudications, information services, people complaining about all sorts of things. So what he's bringing to us and what you're going to hear about today is his experience in understanding where these disputes come from and ideally helping to resolve them. So um, I suppose with that scene set, Chris, I might let you talk a little bit about yourself and what we're doing today. Thanks, Frank. Hello, everyone. Um, just a quick note to say that you can ask questions live today. Um, there is a QA and a function there. Uh, we'll try and get to as many, if not all of them today as we can. If for some reason we've got a big backlog and we don't get to it, we'll try and get to you afterwards. Um, <clears throat> Frank's dulcet tones there summed up things pretty well. I've been with Hines now for six months after five years as commissioner. Um, I might begin with a bit of a stat because everyone loves stats. There are over half a million, well no, that's incorrect, I'll start again. There are over 50,000 schemes in Queensland and by scheme I'm talking about the building. 50,000 of them in Queensland and growing every year. So I guess the first point I'd make is that if you feel like there's something not quite right at your building, uh, a problem, communication breakdown, personality conflict, clash, dispute, you're not alone. Um, it is happening elsewhere and chances are almost the identical problem is happening elsewhere. But today I'm going to run through how that currently works, but I'm also going to run through with you a way I think it would work a bit better in the future. Hopefully you can all see my uh, PowerPoint presentation. The first slide there should say Heinz Legal and the title, take the pressure down. Please send through a Q&A to say that you can't see it. Um, so as I said, today we're going to talk about disputes. It's all well and good to say body corporate dispute, body corporate dispute, body corporate dispute, but what are we actually talking about in that situation? It's actually nowhere near as obvious as you may think. Then I'm going to talk about solutions. So the solutions as they have been up to this point in time, but I'm going to tell you about what I think the new solutions are. I'm also going to give you a case study and a bit of best practice while we're at it. If you see my eyes darting around, it's because I'm managing two different screens while we're doing this sort of thing. But rest assured, I am very much watching proceedings. <laughs> so when we talk about body corporate disputes, what are we actually talking about? So. I'll try and break this down for you and Frank leap in as you need to. Um, first of all, there's disputes if you own a lot. So oftentimes, not always, but most of the time, if you own management rights or letting rights, you also own a lot in the scheme. You never lose your rights as a lot owner, I should say. Some of your other rights uh, are curtailed a bit because you're a caretaker, but your rights as a lot owner remain. Your right to vote in an AGM remains for example. Um, it does, so disputes are not confined solely to your contract as a caretaker. Then we have disputes as a committee member. So you're automatically a committee, you're automatically a non-voting committee member if you have the management rights. You're automatically on the committee and therefore as part of the committee, uh, if the uh, the committee is often named as a respondent to a body corporate dispute. And let's just clarify what we mean there. The committee is the executive decision making arm of the body corporate. You are a member of that decision making body, although you don't have any voting rights of that, but definitely committees are involved in body corporate disputes. Uh, one which often gets overlooked in my experience is disputes about or involving occupiers. What's an occupier? I hear you say. An occupier is the technical term given to a tenant. So under body corporate legislation, an occupier definitely has rights and responsibilities. An occupier can initiate a dispute. An occupier can definitely be a respondent to a dispute as well. And your involvement there, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, and, and probably uh, it's interesting, like the Act doesn't define tenants. It refers to occupiers and that is both short and long term occupiers. So obviously in a management rights context, long stay complexes, six month tenancies, all those sorts of things. Uh, the short stay stuff, uh, occupiers uh, and 
you know, still the theme of the month and year uh, has been short term rentals, Airbnb stays and all those sorts of things. So Chris was actually on the ABC last week talking about um, dealing with disputes involving effectively short stay occupiers and what he thinks the solutions might be for that. And I think that's up on our Facebook page and all that sort of stuff. So if you want to go to that uh, link at some stage, you can do that to his views, which he can now express. I think in terms of this is what the government should do as opposed to being a government employee and not being able to express an opinion. So it's interesting. Indeed it is Frank and there are many there are a few different ways you can be involved in a dispute involving an occupier. If you are the uh, managing agent so you hold the lending rights and that occupier is one of your tenants you're involved that way but you can also be involved as part of the committee uh, uh, or if there is an outside agent you may have some ability to be involved also. Uh, disputes in which you have an interest in these are the sorts of disputes where you're, you're not the direct party either with the dispute or having the dispute made against you, but you certainly have an interest in the outcome. So examples of those would be if there's a motion to change the CMS to include a particular bylaw. Again, maybe short term letting is one of those. Um, you aren't the person who has initiated it. You're not the person responding to it. But you are definitely interested in the outcome regardless of how it finishes. And then last but not least, disputes about you and your role. So this is a dispute about your performance as a caretaker, uh, disputes in which you are the applicant or in which you directly are the respondent. In the commissioner's office, in my former office, you wouldn't be in that last one terribly much because the commissioner's office doesn't usually handle many disputes involving caretakers, but we'll get to that a bit more. Um, probably the important thing to say about body corporate disputes, they're all different. Uh, they are unique. They have a lot of moving parts. Um, it's all well and good to try and apply a consistent approach towards disputes, but every single one of them is going to be different. So you can rely upon cases that have gone before, but you can't apply a blanket rule. It just will not work. Experience tells us this. So with that in mind, let's continue to talk about it. So I've talked a little bit about me and my role. Yes, uh, Scott was right there uh, at the start. There is only one body corporate commissioner in the world and for five years that was me. And now there is a new lucky commissioner whose job it is to deal with all of these things. Um, the commissioner's office does uh, two things, provides a lot of education and information, but today we're talking about dispute resolution. <clears throat> and, they, and that happens two ways, via conciliation, and adjudication. As the name suggests, conciliation, it's like alternative dispute. It's a form of alternative dispute resolution. You will have a departmental conciliator, so an officer from the commissioner's office, sit down between the two parties and basically bang their heads together until they get an agreement. Um, and they do very well at it, I've got to tell you. Up to about three quarters of all disputes that go to conciliation get a result. Uh, that's a fantastic outcome. Um, for those disputes that don't get solved there and for some other disputes, they'll go straight to adjudication, which is exactly as the name suggests, the independent umpire will make the decision and give an order. That order, it's legally binding. So you can actually go and enforce that in the magistrate's court. You can also appeal that in the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. One point to make about my former office, it has what's called exclusive jurisdiction, which means, as Frank said at the start, pretty much everybody corporate and dispute in Queensland will ultimately go to my former office to be resolved, except um, for what we call complex matters. Complex matters, I think, Frank, the best way of explaining that, they're contractual issues, contractual disputes. Any kind of contractual dispute will not go to my former office and usually goes to the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, which is exactly what that's, that line now says. There is the option for something called specialist adjudication too, which is where the parties agree to have somebody appointed to resolve the dispute. They also agree to pay for it as well. Very rare that that happens. It does happen though. And as I said before, contractual in nature. And this gets back to my point earlier, which is that you as a caretaker 
will very rarely find yourself in my former office as a direct party to a dispute. It is far more common that you'll find yourself involved in a more general way, providing your invaluable perspective on the dispute. And Chris, if I might jump in there, I suppose, and the typical way that a Q, dispute in QCAT starts in relation to management rights is in relation to performance of duties. So what will happen, um, and I'd say probably of all the management rights disputes in there, this would be at least 80% of them. There's unhappiness about the performance of the duties. The body corporate issues a remedial action notice. So that's a notice to the caretaker to say, hey, you're required to do X, Y, and Z. You're not doing X, Y, and Z. We require you to start doing X, Y, and Z within a period of time. Usually then there's a response from the caretaker's lawyers uh, to say, no, we're not required to do X, Y, and Z, or we have done Z, and we don't think you're right about what Y is or whatever it might be. Body corporate then says, you know what? We don't care about your response. We're gonna to go to general meeting to try to terminate the agreements. So that's the familiar dance routine at that stage. What happens then is the caretaker would usually file an application in QCAT, which is then a complex dispute because what we've got is a contractual dispute about what the agreement actually requires and what the duties to be performed are. Um, they'll file an application with QCAT uh, seeking orders around preventing the body corporate from terminating the agreement at general meeting in the first instance and then secondary sort of part of it is that we have done what we were required to do and those things then uh, and I suppose the next slide talks about this Chris so I won't cut off that's the typical way a management rights dispute um, enters into QCAT. Oh, that's right that's right well said Frank. Uh, just a quick note for everyone asking questions we've got a few there don't worry uh, my eye is definitely on them we will get to those probably more towards the end but keep the questions coming um, we'll try and answer them all as we go forward just to file and then the final point I've got up there on the screen general legal proceedings so there might be a need to pursue some general legal proceedings for different things Unfortunately, a very common way in which general legal proceedings might get initiated is in relation to defamation. And I say unfortunately because we're seeing more and more of it. Um, a very costly, very time consuming, very, very unhappy process. There is probably a better way, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, back to my former office just briefly, they're in the business of dispute resolution. Quick note about dispute resolution. Resolution doesn't mean that you get everything that you want. Resolution means the problem ends or the, or the particular matter ends at that point. More often than not, uh, resolution means that you will not get 100% of what it is that you are arguing for. You might get a certain percentage of it and you certainly run uh, at least a 50-50 risk of getting nothing if it proceeds to a formal outcome. So. For those people who always want to leap to the umpire's decision, adjudication or QCAT or whatever the case may be, a note of caution, uh, you run a risk of being severely disappointed at the end of it. Because when you proceed to that, there will always be a winner and there will always be a loser. The loser might be you in that particular situation. I think you want to avoid it. Frank thinks you want to avoid it. We're going to talk about how you avoid it. Mm. I've talked a lot about people, the top, yep. As I was say, the only people who uh, sort of want to charge into litigation are the ones that have never been there before. Once you've been through it, you realise that's not or, where you want to be. Or it's people who have way too much money. Uh, I don't think anybody watching today falls into that category somehow. Um, talked a bit about dispute types and how they get resolved. How about we talk a bit about costs? What are the costs of dispute? The most obvious one is, one of the most obvious ones is time. To get a matter to adjudication in my former office, six months, eight months before you get the order, that's not gonna help anybody. Because remember, there's a big difference between lodging it and getting the outcome. Things fester in that period of time. Things have a very, very strong possibility of getting worse. Then there's money, of course. Um, I think there's a, a very well-known uh, case in QCAT, Frank, about non-performance of care or alleged non-performance of caretakers duty in which the costs were around a million dollars of which the body corporate had to pay uh, 600 
thousand, I think, or something like that. I think the manager ended up winning and had yep. to spend five hundred grand of their own money after yep. after they had awards of costs from the body corporate. So, That's and this is the thing with litigation; it just um, keeps chewing on itself. I had a, an analogy that um, an American client gave me the other day that he got a thousand years ago. Um, before he came out to Australia, where he was talking to his lawyer at that point in time about litigation and the lawyer, and I'll use the American terminology, had a dump truck full of dimes. So you could, you could fill this dump truck full of dimes and what I'm gonna do is back it up to the front steps of the courthouse and every day that goes by, I tip it up a little bit more and a little bit more and all your money falls out on the ground and you're never getting it back. And the closer we get to the hearing, the steeper it gets and the more that falls out. So everyone thinks litigation is expensive and it absolutely is. And part of the problem, as Chris pointed out before, is you're not necessarily in control of the process. Yep. You don't, and you don't, you cannot guarantee an outcome. You know, it, it is, everyone goes into their dispute thinking they're gonna win. No one really charges headlong into any form of litigation or, dis, or, or formal dispute resolution, be that in QCAT, commissioner's office or otherwise, thinking they're gonna lose. Yet every single decision in, in a court process, there's no, yeah, sure, here's a mediated outcome, you get half, you get half, and away we go. It's all or nothing. And so of every single proceeding that has ever been commenced, there is a winner and a loser. Perfect. Half of the people lose. And it's sort of pricing that risk is impossible because it does depend a lot on circumstances behind the scenes, who said what to who and when, some little bit of correspondence, uh, the member or the judge's opinion on the day. You know, some of the really bad ones are the ones, the, the evidentiary ones in terms of he said, she said. They said this, no, they didn't say this and it's all verbal. And at that stage, it's a battle of credibility in terms of who the adjudicator actually believes. And you yep. cannot possibly quantify the risk in that. Definitely, Frank. Another cost you face is an intangible cost. Uh, what I mean here is the fact that don't forget that every time a dispute goes to my former office, there's a register of them. That register gets searched by people. Uh, if I'm thinking of buying an apartment in that building and I see 20 disputes in the last year involving different things, I'm hardly likely to buy into that building. For you as a caretaker, there's a reputational cost as well. You don't want to be involved in a dispute if you don't have to, even if it's got very little to do with you or you had nothing to do with initiating it. Being involved can sometimes tar you with that brush. You don't want that. But for me, the biggest thing, the stress of the situation. Um, I, know, I know about the stress of actually handling the dispute, so I can only imagine how it is for people involved in them. And I would see it day in, day out as commissioner. People have become so locked into their position, so locked into the idea of winning and winning at all costs, they'd lost sight of what was important anymore. To the point where quite a few people who continued to come back to my office for dispute resolution, I think were had a form of PTSD. It was pretty clear from the way they conducted themselves and the sorts of things that they said. I can tell you that being involved in any kind of dispute resolution process can be extraordinarily stressful. You want to avoid that if you can. Yeah, it's a sleep at night factor. You wake <coughs> up at three, at three o'clock in the morning worrying about what's going on, worrying about the outcome, worried about the costs. Um, it's just like putting a, you know, you can put a dollar value on legal costs, but it's that time and stress because the other thing is these proceedings don't run themselves. You know, so from a lawyer's perspective, we can certainly do the framework, we can guide clients around it, but there's still from the client perspective, the need for a whole heap of instruction and probably even worse at times is revisiting what was that led you there. You're going back through correspondence from 12 or 18 months ago that you don't want to put your head in, but you're forced to put your head in because that's the nature of the proceeding. We need instructions around it. So there's sort of there's, there's, there's all these things that go into a piece of litigation that then, then can, in commissioned office eight months, in QCAT, um, I think the one we mentioned before, that ran for about four and a half years. So it's four and a half years, day in, day out, of living in a dispute, which is just brutal. Yep, it sure is, Frank, it sure is. Um, hopefully this works. Uh, this, I think, this clip 
the try hopefully will, will work when I'm about to play it, I think sums up what a lot of people tend to think of when they think about solving a dispute. Let's see. I haven't got the volume, mate. No volume? No volume. Have you got it turned down? I can hear it. Uh, I can't. Okay. What we might do is cut it into the links yeah, afterwards. Yeah. That's all right. That's all right. For those of you who could not hear that, some technical issues, that's a clip from War of the Roses, Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. Uh, the film, for those of you who haven't seen it, husband and wife whose relationship deteriorates rapidly over a period of time. And in that scene, there's the invitation from one to the other to just go ahead, hit me. You'll, you'll, that's what you want, isn't it? To make yourself feel better. I think a lot of people think that that's how dispute gets resolved. You know, get it all out, have that happen, and we move on. But nah, I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> because even when you win, you stand to lose. So in that case where you're looking for winners and losers, a winners, losers kind of scenario, even if you win, you lose. And I've gone over these a little bit already, but they're worth repeating. First of all, there's legal costs. So you will usually meet your own costs in all jurisdictions. And even if you win, you only very, very occasionally get some costs back. And that's certainly true of my former office. I touched well, upon commissioner's this, office yeah. is a cost-free jurisdiction and QCAT, if you get half, you do well. Most most of them are less. That's right. I've touched upon this one before, reputational damage. Do you want to be known as the party who had been involved in a long protracted fight with the committee, especially if that dispute gets reported? Uh, and I can tell you from experience, body corporate disputes have an uncanny knack of ending up on the front page of the Gold Coast Bulletin. <clears throat> then there's reputational damage. You go through a dispute resolution process, you get an outcome, it might be in your favour, you think to yourself, that's great, I've won. Well, have you really? Because your relationship with the people involved is poisoned from that point afterwards. And it's very, very difficult to repair the relationship after that. Uh, and it's particularly worrisome for you if that relationship has been damaged and the relationship in, in question is with someone who's in a position of influence. Um, over you and over your contract. You've got to keep that in mind. And as I said before, the commercial damage that you suffer. Uh, all of the all, all, all of the orders, adjudicators orders, QCAT orders, they're all publicly available. You don't want your building to be known as the problem building, the building that's got all of the disputes. That's not going to help you in the long run. And from Frank, a anything? buyer's perspective, from a legal due diligence, that's absolutely part of what we look at. You know, we look at the disputes that have gone on in that building and see whether any of them relate to the manager. And I mean, I had a phone call this morning where there's a building that had a couple of disputes, but they related to the typical body corporate's not maintaining my deck, they should be maintaining my deck, et cetera, et cetera. So the clients, as a buyer, has asked me, is this a problem for us? I said, no, that's run of the mill for where you are. Don't worry about that. Clearly the committee and, the, and that lot owner didn't deal with it. But if there were disputes uh, between the manager and the committee, that would be a red flag from a buyer's perspective because it says there's something going on there. Is it personality based? Is it the manager? Is it the committee? Yeah, is it exactly. the body corporate manager? Is it whatever? But it's a red flag. Where the smoke there's fire, Frank. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if everyone puts their hand up and say, I didn't do anything. I'm not in the wrong. Doesn't matter. Um, a list of 20 disputes in a building over the course of two years tells you that something is very, very wrong there. And that has a huge commercial impact. So now I'm going to talk about the new solutions. Again, just a quick note about your questions. Definitely can see them all. We're getting a few building up there. So if you do have a question you want answered today, I'd suggest you start to get in there pretty soon or you might miss out. Um, the solutions. So I'm here and Frank and I are here to talk about mediation and a couple of things related to that. I'm the person with, uh, one of the reasons I moved to Heinz is so I could offer mediation as a solution to problems. So it's, um, it's a model which is built in part upon the kind of a conciliation approach that my former office provides. I mentioned before they have up to three quarters of all disputes get resolved at conciliation. 
that's a great result if it could be replicated in a mediation context. The other advantage of mediation is that I bring my expertise to it. So you would all know that body corporate law, body corporate issues can be complex, difficult, technical. Um, the ability to have somebody there who knows what they're talking about, who knows what section blah blah says, who knows of an adjudicator's order that has said something, that, well, yeah, you won't get that in any other forum. Um, even if you don't get everything you want, you come away from mediation in a better position than where you started. And the best example I can give you of that is that you might have 10 items that you're in dispute about. Say you're a caretaker, you've got 10 items you're in dispute about with the committee. You finish the mediation, four of those things are off the agenda, done, dealt with. And you might say to yourself, yeah, but we only dealt with four of them. But think about it this way, that's four less that you're going to have to deal with in future. And if you do need to go to QCAP, that's four less things that you're going to be arguing about there. Uh, that's going to save you an awful lot of time and an awful lot of money and an awful lot of stress. Mediation isn't about you singing Kumbaya at the end of it and holding hands and being best friends. That's not what it's about. In fact, I would argue that you shouldn't be best friends with everybody you deal with in a body corporate. Body corporate to me is like a business. It's the day to day running of an operation which can involve millions of dollars. You don't need to get you don't need to be best friends. What you do need is professional enough relationships so that the day to day mechanics keep running, keep ticking over. If you do happen to become friends with someone afterwards, great. You don't have to and it is not essential to the process. So a bit more about the mediation I provide. It's not restricted by jurisdiction. I mentioned a few times before how my former office can rarely handle a dispute involving a caretaker. Not me, uh, I'm not restricted by that. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about a case study in a moment where I did just that. So I can uh, mediate a dispute amongst committee members. I can mediate a dispute involving schemes under what's called BUGTA. I can potentially mediate disputes involving a BMS. All of the things that my former office cannot do. As I said before, it's expertise based. I'm not going to give you answers. Uh, I'm also not going to tell you that you're wrong. And I'm also not going to take sides. I remain impartial throughout, but I will use my expertise to very, very gently guide you to thinking about something if I think that that might be useful to getting you somewhere. So the process. Uh, Actually, Chris, I might um, just jump in there and it's really it's been interesting for me working with Chris because as a lawyer, um, you are trained to pick sides. We act for people. We don't sit in the middle of solving things. So no matter what, my whole life has been representing people against other people. So even in a, in a commercial transaction, you're acting for a buyer and a seller, you're looking out for your client. You're not necessarily looking out for the other side. So so a lawyer's mindset has blinkers in terms of seeing one side of the things. Chris has never ever had that indoctrination. So Chris, as commissioner particularly, um, had to be incredibly impartial. And for those of you that saw him in his former role out doing seminars and that sort of stuff, um, he's very, very good at not picking sides. Whereas by default, that's what I do because that's what I've been trained to do. So um, it's really interesting and, and to see him in action. Very good these at things. Aside, I have yes. <laughs> and providing opinions. Yeah. <laughs> As am I, uh, but just in a slightly different way, I guess. Um, the process. Uh, it begins with <clears throat> the parties agreeing to participate. So you need to agree, you need to do it willingly. Um, you sign the paperwork that we send out, um, which binds you to going ahead. I then do what's called intake. Uh, intake is a bit of a fancy word, but it basically means I get a submission from each side uh, that's involved. Intake also means I might speak with you briefly on the phone, have a chat beforehand, just go through a few points. Uh, intake also means I do my research as well. Yes, believe it or not, there are some things I need to research. Uh, so if I get information beforehand that the dispute is about something that I don't know a huge amount about, that gives me time to look up the relevant sections, perhaps a few cases, perhaps a few articles even that might shed a bit of light on proceedings. 
And then once we've done all the intake, we hold the mediation session. That can be in person or more likely, given the current environment, it'll be a virtual one over a forum such as this or a different kind of forum. Uh, run usually for around four hours. If you are balking at that and going four hours, let me tell you that four hours flies. It really flies when you are getting your way through things. Um, uh, it's a combination of time spent together as the disputing parties, but also time spent separately with me talking to you one on one. Uh, and in a way, mediation is split into <coughs> two sections. What's happened up to now? and then the future. Where, where are we going from this point and how do we get there? That's kind of how mediation is. It also follows a structure which I step you through. I keep a pretty good eye on the time. Frank will tell you I'm very good at doing that um, so that everybody uh, is focused and importantly everybody gets equal hearing or I aim to give everybody as equal hearing as possible. What are the benefits? I hear you cry. Well, the time. Uh, I can have the parties organised for a mediation session within one to two weeks after you signing up. That's how quickly it can be done. So instead of six or 18 months at say QCAT, one to two weeks. Uh, costs. There is a huge difference between spending a million dollars at QCAT or my fee for mediating. Let me assure you, I do not cost a million dollars, notwithstanding what Frank might think. About how expensive I am. Um, it's going to save you an awful lot of stress. It, <coughs> it must. That's the whole point of it. And it's success, even if you don't get everything that you want. And relationship building. Again, I'm not talking about being best buddies. It's about the professional relationship sufficient enough to move you forward from the point that you're at that's brought you there. And I think that's a really big thing, that last one there, Chris, because these, you know, it's sort of um, the strata relationships that everyone's in are really different to what is a normal commercial relationship. So uh, you can sit there and watch Chris and I today, and if you decide I don't like what these idiots are talking about, you just delete us from our lives, from your lives, you, you unsubscribe from our newsletters. Next time you see an invitation for an REI asked a webinar, you go, no, I'm not doing that. We're out of your life. Doesn't matter, you'll never see us again. But in Strata, you can't do that. You're in an ongoing contractual relationship with your body corporate. You are going to be dealing with these committee members. You are going to be dealing with these lot owners repeatedly. And it's a matter of trying to get that relationship onto a footing that, as Chris said, is workable. Don't need yeah. to be holding hands. We're not going to the footy with each other or playing rounds of golf or all that sort of stuff. But it must be workable because if it's not, it's just brutal. Yeah, and by that's all means, what, this, by this all creates means, that yep. opportunity. By all means, come home and rant and brave about how awful that committee is. Just don't do it in front of them. Just don't do it to them. This is this this is it. It's about establishing a much better way of engaging thereafter. Um, so, a case study. This is recent mediation that I conducted. So, unsurprisingly, issues between a caretaker and a committee, and they had a lot of issues. Believe you me. So it was a large scheme with a mix of commercial and residential, so that just complicates it a wee bit further. Uh, I've got there 12 months of built up tension. There's probably more like several years worth of built up tensions. There were myriad concerns and, and the interesting thing here is that it wasn't just concerns about the performance of the caretaker's duties either. Caretaker was very concerned about how governance was being done on the committee and as it turned out, rightly so, based upon <coughs> some of the things I heard. But then it also became apparent that there were factions and ructions within the committee itself. That was not easy to deal with. As I say, there are issues amongst the committee. So as much as it was a mediation between caretaker and committee, there were issues amongst the committee as well. In this particular case, this was conducted in person, so we were all socially distanced, which was its own challenge, but we got there in the end. Um, this was also a situation where the committee elected to cover all the costs. 
in a typical mediation scenario, the parties would split the costs. The reason for that is that if you split the costs, you're more likely to be engaged with the process. Committee took it upon themselves to enter into this and, and have the caretaker agree to it because they saw that as a positive step in improving the relationship with the caretaker. And there so I how did it go? Yeah, probably yeah. one of the reasons for that was because a fellow on the committee was a lawyer who understands the benefits of mediation as opposed to litigation. Yeah, and he basically told them you have to do this or else. Um, he didn't say it in quite those words, but that's pretty much what he meant. So how did it go? Well, we finished up by getting an agreement on a few points, certainly not all the points that they all wanted, but we got them to agree to a few things. Uh, I won't go into detail about the things that we agreed to because that's not, not appropriate to reveal that, but I can tell you there was some interesting discussion about a few things. Um, there were all of the usual concerns about a big building. Parking was one of them. CCTV was another concern. Um, we didn't get to all the details about that, but we got to what I thought was a really good agreement about how the committee would communicate with its within itself in future. That is no small thing. After everybody left, uh, the body corporate manager who actually attended the entire mediation, so that of itself is a bit unusual, <coughs> remarked to me, that's the first time I've seen them talking in a long, long time. That's the first time that I have seen them actually show a willingness to engage with each other for a long time. That's no small thing, believe you me. For some of you who I'm sure are in a situation where you're not talking to your committees or they're not talking to you, to be able to spend four hours and come out of it having a basis on which to talk with people, that's a huge result, a huge result. Uh, and we did end up signing an agreement which they have now got. I don't monitor the compliance with that agreement. And in fact, I don't have anything else to do with this particular scheme now that that mediation is finished. That's theirs to deal with. And I made that point to them all the way through. Whatever you do today is yours. Yours to discuss, yours to work out, yours to monitor and force thereafter. Hopefully, I hope, fingers crossed, that they are actually doing it. Um, interestingly in this one, and again, not giving away details about it, but interestingly in this one, the mediation was a precursor to some legal, uh, not action, but some legal discussion which was due to take place afterwards. So in effect, the mediation was a precursor to some contract negotiations. I think actually a really good idea. The mediation resolved a few things, narrowed a few issues, and hopefully will make the contract negotiations just a little more straightforward when they come up, which is in the not too distant future. So, <coughs> I've talked a lot about mediation. Um, I'm gonna talk about best practice now. So. For, Remembering what I've just said, if you've got a problem, if you've got a body corporate dispute, here's your best practice for getting it resolved. Step one, there's no substitute for this one, you get informed. There is a lot of misinformation out there in body corporate world, you need to get informed. Uh, my forum office is a great place to start, they have excellent resources there, uh, most of which I wrote. Um, <laughs> not, that's not why they're excellent, by the way. Um, <laughs> but they do, they do inform you and it's largely free. The other way you get informed is by getting professional advice. There is no substitute for professional advice. If you want advice about water ingress, you'll talk to a plumber or an engineer. If you want advice about building and construction, you'll talk to a builder. <coughs> you'll have to excuse me, everyone. I've just got a bit of a tickle in my throat today. You got the rhino, uh, mate. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, but if you want legal advice, you'll talk to a lawyer. That's how you get informed. Step two is what I call self-resolution. This is actually required at law. So if you wanna to go to my former office, you need to demonstrate you've tried to resolve things yourself. If you don't do that, you won't pass go, you won't proceed. Uh, one of the most obvious ways of self-resolution is just writing to someone and making a demand of them. Another way that my former office will always look at have you voted at the GM where this motion was considered or can you put a motion to a general meeting? And Step three. Yep. Jump in just with that self-resolution bit. One of the one of the things that, um, so there's the mediation element and then probably there's another, uh, what are you gonna call it, consultancy element, I suppose, that uh, Chris and I have done. We, 
didn't have on the list of things that would turn into work, but certainly has, helping people sort of see the forest for the trees to a degree in terms of their particular issues. Because what happens is, Chris was saying, they, they, they get all bound up in this thing and can't sort of see their way out of it. What we've done um, more often than, uh, I mean, this would be half a dozen times now already, help sat down on a Zoom with committees or with clients and help them sort of narrow down the issues, help them understand where they need to go and help them to try to self-resolve things themselves without, again, the need for legal intervention straight up. So it's sort of really, here's your issue, here's how you can try to get there. So that self-resolution right. might be as simple as, uh, as coming up with an agreed set of expectations around performance, around communication, around reporting, all of those sort of things. Because what happens is these things escalate up and up and up and up, and then people start doing no talkies and positions start to get entrenched. And that's where we're trying to get in front of that and help clients get in front of that with the sort of advisory slash consultancy stuff that Chris is running. So we've seen some real good success in that as well. Absolutely, well, and that's very much a form of self-resolution. Um, Quite different to mediation, but the same kind of concept. I'll whiz through these next steps relatively quickly because I am conscious of the questions there and we're approaching 10 minutes to go. Step three, I'm suggesting it's mediation. That's, and we've talked about that today. <coughs> Step four, formal proceedings. As Frank said before, in a very good point, you never lose the right to go legal, but there are a whole lot of other steps you want to try first before you get there. Because at the moment, five, you, yep. you can't stop, you can't That's unscramble right. that egg. And then step five, I think the step a lot of people forget, reflect. Reflect upon not just the other party and what happened, but reflect on your role in the dispute. Is there something you could have done differently? Uh, I would suggest the answer is always going to be yes in that case. Our details are up there on screen. Always happy to take a call or an email to see if we can help out on a particular issue. Uh, I won't be dishing out uh, free legal advice, mainly because I'm not a lawyer, neither will Frank, uh, but we will at least start a conversation with you at all times and see where we can get to. Scott, back to you. Uh, th thanks again for everyone joining. Really appreciate Chris and Frank's insight, especially Chris today. I think having an insider's guide to um, the scheme gives a, a lot of people reassurance that, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel because it can be stressful, cost a lot of money and also damage your reputation. So thanks again for giving that insight, Chris, and hopefully more people take that advice on board and uh, less disputes have to go through the, the legality side of things. And 12 or 18 months is a long time and it can be very stressful. Yeah. And mate, we're super happy to chat to people in Principal about what their questions or concerns or issues might be. You know, yeah. it's one of, the, one of the difficulties with this thing for us is it's brand new. Yes. You know, traditionally, the only way to resolve a dispute is to sue someone. So it's sort of it, it's helping people understand the process, which which this is absolutely part of. But if, you, if people have specific questions or whatever, Chris or I, and particularly Chris from a mediation perspective, are super happy to talk to them about it in terms of whether we think it might or might not work, what the barriers might be, how to get people across the line or whatever. Because um, in body corporate land, Chris, Chris is a bit of a god, uh, I'll say that. As, as the former commissioner, um, the person that ran the commissioner's office, all of the body's corporate and all of the body corporate managers know who he is. So there's an instantaneous sort of recognition of his abilities in that respect. So um, normally we don't have much difficulty gaining traction to say we can help you sort things out. Thank you, Frank. Right. Really, really appreciate that, that Frank. Um, Obviously, that puts a target on Chris's back now. You've probably thrown him under the bus. But as you say, if you can give that insight to our clients that have joined today, that definitely puts them in a, a great spot. Yeah, no worries. Um, just to wrap it up, um, as I say, we will upload this video. Um, we do have videos on YouTube from Frank's previous sessions that might um, shed some insight into other matters. Um, also, we do have another seminar coming up on the 22nd of September. Um, which we'll talk about sales and marketing. So keep your um, eyes peeled for that as that comes out. Thanks again. Thanks all. See you everyone. Bye. Welcome to REI Cloud Insights. Today I'm going to show you one of the latest features in REI Cloud called Communities. Communities offers comprehensive tools for body corporate, 
building managers and developers for reporting and communicating with key stakeholders. Let's have a sneak peek. Within communities in REI Cloud, you can easily identify and set up your body corporate committee members at a click of a button. Communication is key, and within REI Cloud, you are able to email or SMS or contacts. You can even contact and keep track of other distinct groups like your rent roll, owner occupiers, lockups, outside lets, and more. You can communicate quickly and directly with your body corporate manager for maintenance, quotation requests, work orders, and reporting. Schedule tasks, including inspections or maintenance for common areas in your complex. You can also let communities do the thinking for you by setting these tasks to reoccur or remind you. You can also integrate the REI Cloud mobile app to perform inspections of common areas to report easily again to your body corporate. You are even able to keep track of keys via the community key register in REI Cloud. Communities in REI Cloud will take the stress out of your role as a building manager. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more REI Cloud insights or contact the sales team today for more information.